Donald Trump has hinted that he is not, he's going to pull America out of the uh, Paris Climate Accords. Um, on your screen behind us, you'll see an image um, that was provided by the Business Insider that shows you what America would look like if all of the ice uh, in the Antarctic, all the ice caps melted. Uh, and you could see the entire Easter seaboard uh, is gone. We start with that image because the conversation really becomes about how much of this damage can we prevent or minimize. And I start with that framing because as many people are aware with the Paris Climate Accords, they were not a fix. They were not a total solution. They were not going to save us, as one article on ProgressiveArmy.com alludes to. However, there is a big difference between doing something and doing nothing, and the amount uh, that we are able to mitigate the damage that we've already set into motion. Um, so in terms of where we are with the climate accords, uh, Donald Trump has not officially announced that he's withdrawing from them. Um, but he has hinted towards it, and there have been sources from the White House who have leaked it and suggested that um, we are no longer going to be a part of it. Uh, now, we're still waiting as of today to see whether or not this is what he's going to do. Uh, in many, if this were a, a, an effective White House, we could say that Donald Trump was floating this information to see how the United States responded to it. Um, but this White House has been anything but effective and efficient, so it's very likely that this information that's being leaked out is the true intention of Donald Trump instead of a trial balloon, um, so to speak. So just a few more details about the, uh, about the Paris deal uh, that was signed in 2015. Um, it was a non-binding agreement. Um, the language of the agreement was negotiated by uh, representatives from 195 countries, uh, and it was adopted into consensus on December 12th of 2015. Developed countries committed to mobilize 100 billion a year in climate finance by 2020, and, uh, and will continue mobilizing uh, finance at the level of $100 billion a year until 2025. On your screen, we have an image of some of the key points uh, that were brought up in this, this accord. Uh, temperatures, uh, temperatures were keep warming well below two degrees Celsius to continue efforts to limit the rise um, in temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, in terms of financing, rich countries must provide $100 billion from 2020 as a floor and that amount to be updated by 2015. In terms of specialization, developed countries must continue to take a lead in the reduction of greenhouses, uh, greenhouse gases, and developing nations are encouraged to enhance their efforts to move over time uh, and to cuts. Uh, in terms of emissions, the emission goals, by 2050, the aim for greenhouse gas emissions to peak as soon as possible was the general goal. Um, from 2050, rapid reductions to achieve a balance between emissions from human activity and the amount that can be captured by sinks. And this is an image um, that was put out by the AFP. Uh, on the second image, you can see the final part of the breakdown of the climate accords, uh, burden sharing. And again, this is by AFP. To develop, developed countries must provide financial resources to help developing countries in this process. Other countries are invited to provide support and on a voluntary basis. Uh, in re a review mechanism by 2025, a review every five years, first mandatory world review was set up to be slated in 2025. Climate related losses, vulnerable countries, um, one recognition of the need for averting, minimizing, and addressing losses suffered due to climate change. And again, this breakdown was provided by AFP. Now, with this, again, we can say that the climate accords were not a end solution. In fact, it was not quite enough to halt all the momentum that we see happening uh, in, with regards to global warming and climate change. However, we get to the conversation of uh, the, the, not even a philosophical conversation, but just the practical, the pragmatic conversation of whether or not if something is not enough, should we do nothing? 
And, and I'm seeing this a lot from uh, some of the progressive left really dismissing Donald Trump's uh, dismissal of the, uh, the climate accords in, in a sense because it did not do enough. I'm not sure that that's the way we should look at this, right? Because it, to, to say something is not enough, yes, that's one thing, and that's the way we should look at it. We should say that this is barely a start, and this is, it is a start. However, to, to take a step back and say this is not enough, so we should not be concerned with the fact that the United States is withdrawing from it, I think is, um, I think is an erroneous uh, train of logic, particularly because if we have the ability to at least mitigate some of the effects, whether or not we're able to stop all the effects, I think some of the people who would be displaced in the years to come would appreciate the fact that we as a world, as a globe, uh, citizens of different nations around the world came together and said that we're going to do what we can to mitigate the effects. Now, this is in the backdrop of a president who really thinks that climate change and global warming is a hoax to raise taxes. I want to share some tweets of him, uh, of Donald Trump, uh, as far back as uh, 2015. He said, it's really cold outside. They are calling it a major freeze. Weeks ahead of normal. Man, we could use a big fat dose of global warming. He went on to say that same year, he said, any and all weather events are used by the global warming hoaxers to justify higher taxes to save our planet. They don't believe it, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. Here's the problem with this is that this is the thinking of the Republican Party in general. Donald Trump is not alone in this decision. In fact, he received a letter from 22 senators, uh, Republican senators, who asked him to withdraw from the climate accords. So we're dealing with a, tr a way of thinking. We're dealing with not only a denial of science, but the, the willingness to use a denial of science to further their own political and economic goals at the expense of future generations. So it's not just Donald Trump who we have to oppose in this issue, it's also the Republican Party as a whole. And not only the Republican Party as a whole, but anyone else who would take no steps or no significant steps to mitigate the oncoming disaster. I wanna phrase it like this. I wanna think about this real quick. If you look at the map behind us, look at the map behind us. Can you imagine, can you imagine the human rights crisis, the, 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 over, the humanitarian disaster right here in the United States. We're not talking about having an issue of foreigners being refugees. We're literally talking about Americans being refugees. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about Americans being shifted and displaced from the eastern seaboard to, and, and, can you imagine the breakdown in society where they estimate over 100 million Americans will be forced from their homes towards the center of America, towards the Midwest? And can you imagine what individual states will do at that point to protect themselves from refugees that are American citizens? And so we are, we're, we're, we're not on a track where we are going to be able to stop the disaster. And I think we should be clear about that. The Paris Climate Accords were not enough, were not sufficient enough to halt this oncoming disaster. But to do nothing is to invite the maximum disaster. And to think about the position that that will put our children and our grandchildren in the next 50 to 100 years really should shine a light on the caliber of people who are leading this country.